God be the glory for the great things that he has done. Amen. Uh, the spirit of the Lord, which is in this place, Amen. to Reverend Buxton and Minister Harley and Reverend Holiday and to our worship leader, Brother Knotts, to all of the officers and members of this great church. Once again, I greet you with the joy of Jesus, who is the risen Savior. Amen. Would you help me in honoring your pastor and my friend, the Reverend Benjamin K. privilege to be able to stand here today on this family and friends day. I love to come and preach here and Reverend Sims asked me to come. I immediately said yes. And he did not have to ask me twice. So I thank God for this, this great opportunity. Amen. There is a word from the Lord on this family and friends day. If you have your Bibles, your phones, your iPads, your tablets, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, beginning at verse 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 14. Before we read, let us pray. God, we thank you for this special day. And you allowed us to come together to celebrate each other as family and friends. We don't take it for granted, Lord, because we do realize that there are those who do not get this opportunity. But because of your grace and your mercy, you allowed us to gather here one more time. And for that, we say thank you. Thank you. thank you for your spirit, which has paid us a visit in this place. And we, can, we ask that you would continue now, through this preached word, to have your way. Yes. Touch my mind now, Lord, and hold it steady. Touch my mouth and allow me Lord. to speak the words that you have for your people to hear. Yes. Help me to preach. Somebody needs a word from me. Yes. Not for my fame or reputation or that anybody might say Damien Brown did a good job. But I preach for this reason, that the saints might be made stronger, that the sinners might be saved, and that you and you alone will get the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Second Chronicles chapter 20, beginning at verse 14. I am reading from the New King James Version. Your Bible should read this way. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all of you Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat, Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed of this great multitude, for this battle is not yours, but God's. All right. All right. Tomorrow go down against them, they will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jerusalem. And you will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And we'll stop right there. The word of God for the people of God. 
praise be unto God. For this family and friends today, I want to preach from this subject, the blueprint for battle. All right. The blueprint for battle. I want to begin by telling you that suffering is an integral part of the Christian journey. Amen. Amen. Suffering and trouble is a part of this walk that we have with oh, yeah. the Lord. Uh -huh. And woe be unto those who yes. preach a gospel that excludes trouble and suffering. Come on. Wow. If Jesus, Paul tells us, if Jesus, God's only son, had holes in his hands and holes in his feet, then surely we're not going to go through this life without a few bumps and bruises along the way. And in our suffering, we've got to remember that God will be with us mm -hmm. through it all. Amen. And so if it is true that we have to suffer, uh, Reverend Buxton, then there is a misconception we've got to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, there, there's, if I dare say, y'all don't get mad at me, but there's a lie we have been believing for far too long. Come on, man. All right. And that is that God will not put more on you than you can bear. Amen. Let me help you here. If God did not put more on you than you can bear, mm. if you could deal with your troubles Come by yourself, yeah. you wouldn't have a need to go to God at all. So God will allow life to put some trouble in your way. But you have to suffer sometimes. And it forces you to learn how to lead and to depend on Him. And in our suffering, sometimes we find ourselves in the midst of a battle that we cannot win in our own power. Here we are in the text. Before us, we find God's people facing a three-headed unified enemy. The story says that the people of Ammon, Mount Seir, and Moab have come together to do battle against God's children. Uh -huh. King Jehoshaphat is their leader. Bible says when Jehoshaphat checked his voicemail, <laughs> he had several messages warning him to get ready to fight. All right. All right. Y'all want to walk through the text for a moment. Verse 3, the Bible tells us that when Jehoshaphat gets the news that he has to fight, it says that he was afraid. Oh, yeah. And let me ask pause here to tell you that when you are facing a battle that you know you cannot win by yourself, yes, it is a natural reaction for fear yes, to rise. Amen. However, my brothers and sisters, you are never allowed fear to drown out your faith. Uh -huh. You watch the text, while he was surely afraid, he had enough good sense mm -hmm. to activate his faith in God. Amen. For the book says that after he was afraid that he set himself to seek the Lord. Right. Uh, he orders a fast and all of the people come together to fast and pray. And because of their faith, God responds with a word. And this is the word that God sends them. God says, calm down, chill out. I got this. This battle is not yours. It is the Lord's. He goes on to say that you will not need to fight. Set yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The next day, early in the morning, they got up. They responded to the word of God by faith and they went down to the battlefield. On their way to the battlefield, Reverend Sims, they began to have praise and worship. Somebody started singing in verse 21, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. And while they were singing on their way down to the battlefield, the Bible tells us that God set up ambushments. In other words, their enemies started fighting themselves. And by the time they got to the battlefield, the enemy was defeated and the victory was already won. So my 
brothers and sisters, if you find yourself like God's children in the text in a battle that you know you cannot win, I want to tell you today, heed the word of God. Respond to God in faith. Trust God and God will fight your battle. That's really all I came to tell y'all this afternoon. If you trust in God, he will fight your battle. Is there anybody in here who don't mind being honest with me and saying you've been in some battles and you knew you could not win? Oh, I've been there can I testify for one moment. I, I've been in some battles that I knew I could not win by myself. I have been down and out. I have been troubled. I have been sick. I wanted to give up. I'm talking about Damian Brown here now. I've been in some places where my money ran out. I called people on the phone, could not get an answer. Family and friends did not understand. But I remember that old song that said, take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. And for every battle I was fighting that I knew I could not win when I turned it over to Jesus, he sure enough worked it out. And I am a living witness this afternoon that God will fight your battle. When you are in a battle that you cannot win, I recommend that you put that thing in the hands of somebody who can do more for you than you can do for yourself. Can I make a recommendation right here? There is a him who is a doctor in the sick room and a lawyer when you get in trouble. There is a him who is bread when you're hungry and water when you are thirsty. There is a him who is a rock in a weary land and a shelter in the time of storm. Can I tell you about him? This him who I'm talking about? Jude calls him like this. Jude said, Jude says, now unto him who is able to keep you from the fall. Is there anybody around this house today that trust in him? I need just a few of y'all to stand from your feet and we can testify together that we have been in some battles who knew we could not win. And when we turn it over to him, he turned our burden into a blessing, our mess into a miracle, and this is our testimony. God will fight your back. Really? You may be seated. I'm just talking. God will. God will fight your back. Can we walk through the text for a moment here? Here we are, Second Chronicles chapter 20. The Bible says they're about to fight this battle. They know they can't win. Uh, and because Jehoshaphat knows he can't win this battle. Verse 3 says he's afraid. Fear is a natural human reaction. Now the scripture tells us that God has not given us a spirit of fear. But that does not mean in this life you won't find yourself in some fearful situation. But here it is. There is a silver lining in the dark cloud called fear. And that is that fear is, should be what drives you to seek God in prayer. I'm in mean, the text. Verse 3 says he was afraid. But by the time we get to the end of verse 4, he had gotten everybody together for prayer. Oh, yeah. Brothers and sisters, prayer. Prayer is the one thing, one of the things that keeps us connected to the will of God for our lives. Not only that, but prayer also is an act of faith that gets God's attention when we need Him the most. The Bible says that they seek the Lord in prayer. And when you read about His prayer, you got to read the whole chapter when you get a chance to read about His prayer. You got to notice the confidence Jehoshaphat has in his God. Here in, 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 the, in the prayer, he begins to say, he says, God, in your hands, there is power. That, that's, that's some confidence there. That's some confidence. And he keeps on praying. And he tells, he tells God, he says, God, we've got some people who have come against us to destroy us. And when he gets to verse 12, he admits, he says, we don't have enough power to fight them by ourselves. But watch the church. Here it is. He says, but Lord, even in the midst of this battle, our eyes are on you. Two things your prayer does. Your prayer is a confession that you cannot make it on your own. Not only that, but your prayers also show that you have confidence in only what God 
can do. Yeah. Now I need to tell you here, it is difficult to have confidence in anything or anybody that you have not tried before. Yeah. But if you got some experience with somebody, uh, if, if you got some experience, if you tried that person or that thing before, then you can have confidence based on what you already know about them. You see, you see, this isn't Jehoshaphat's first rodeo with God. Because if you read the prior two chapters, 18 and 19, you'll find out that he had just come out of a battle mm -hmm. where God spared his life. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so Jehoshaphat had some experience with God. In other words, he knew, uh, like Todd Tribbett sings, if he'd done it before, I believe I got a witness in here. And so, and so when there is a battle, my friends, that you know you cannot win, the first thing you must do is seek God in prayer. Prayer means that you need God. Prayer means you have confidence in God. But can I give you one more good reason to pray? Don't miss it. It's real simple here. Prayer still works. Yeah, you can clap right there. Prayer still works. I mean, the Bible, the text says that after they pray, the Spirit of the Lord showed up in the prayer meeting. That's why? Because prayer still works. You see, prayer can open doors that will close in your face. Prayer can make a nasty supervisor get off your back and act like Prayer can take your place your money and connections can't do. I have a witness in here. Is there anybody in here besides me that knows that prayer still works? Can prayer still heal the sick? Can prayer still raise the dead? Can prayer open doors for God to do miracles in your life? That's why the Bible says that the fervent, effectual prayer of the righteous availeth much. If you find yourself fighting a battle, you cannot win. You've got to seek God in prayer. Every now and then, you've got to get down on your knees and say, Father, I stretch my hands to get there. No other help I know. And can I tell you, just a little talk with Jesus. We'll make it all right. In this blueprint for battle, the first thing you've got to do is seek God in prayer. Amen. And so because they seek God in prayer, the Spirit of the Lord shows up. Mm -hmm. Came upon the prophet Jehaziel. And God gives them a good word. Mm -hmm. God says, relax, y'all. I got this. I know this is a battle that you can't win. That's why this battle is not yours. But it is the Lord. Then God goes on to give them some directions. Mm -hmm. He says here, he says, uh, uh, tomorrow I want you to go down to the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Set yourselves. Mm -hmm. Stand still. Uh -huh. And see the salvation yeah. of the Lord. Is that what your Bible says? Yeah. He tells them to do three things. Set yourself, stand still, mm -hmm. and see the salvation of the Lord. Now I've got to ask a question here. God just said, this is not their battle. Am I right about it? Uh -huh. Why then is he giving them directions on what to do? If, if God says, you ain't got to fight, this is my battle, then, then why is God asking me to do some things in this battle? Here is the answer. You have got to participate in the process that God is using to give you your victory. All right. Too many times uh, we want God to do everything for us. But no, my friends, that's not how it works. God is not going to do everything for you. He's going to do for you what you can't do for yourself while you participate in the process. John Calvin, John Calvin, the great theologian, said that in the majority of miracles in the Bible that involve human beings, not only is there divine intervention, but there's also human cooperation. Oh, yeah. In other words, people who needed miracles from God did their part. While God performed the miracle, that thing they could not do for themselves. Uh -huh. And so if yes, this church is going to go to a higher level, if you are going to go to another level in your walk with God, then you must be a willing participant in the plan God has for your life. 
That's why, that's why my prayer for churches everywhere, my prayer for this church is God deliver us from, from lazy Christians. God deliver us from the spirit of laziness. Je Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. Most of us can quote it, but God says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and to give you a future. Now, we get happy on that verse, but we've got to read the whole chapter because before God gives them this promise of the bright future, he says, there's some things you're going to have to do. He says, first, you're going to have to build some houses. You're going to have to plant some gardens. And if you're not married, you're going to have to get married. You're going to have to seek the peace of the city. Uh, God says, in other words, if you want the promise to come true in your life, there are some things you got to do. You, you, you got to do something. Somebody help me preach here and shout, do something. Yeah, you you got to participate in the process uh, if you want the victory that God has for you. In other words, you got to get your hands to work it. And you gotta get your feet to moving. Somebody shout, do something. You 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 unemployed or underemployed and looking for a better job, you gotta do something. You, you gotta get your resume together and apply for the job. Somebody shout, do something. Yeah, you, you trying to get in shape, trying to get healthy, trying to lose weight, need to be in better health. You gotta do something. Get up and go to the gym. Go, go take a walk every now and then. Somebody shout, do something. You, you tired of hanging around fake? And phony friends drop like a bad habit. Find some people who know how to pray. You gotta do something. Now you you broken and you trying to get some more money. You gotta do something. Give. And the Bible says God will give back to you. Press down and shake it together and run it over. You gotta do something if you want a blessing from God. And when you do something, when you participate in the process, God will step in and make a way. First, gotta seek God in prayer and trust in God in those times. Sometimes will make you look foolish. Uh -huh. I'm in the text, verse 17. The Bible says, "You will not need to fight in this battle." Mm -hmm. He says, "Set yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord." Mm -hmm. Can I translate that for you? Here's what God is saying. He's saying. I want y'all to go down to the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Don't take no knives. Don't take no guns. Don't take no weapons. Don't call nobody to help you to fight. I want you to get down there, get in place, and look at your enemy. Now, wait a minute, God. I got a battle that you said you know I can't win. I got three enemies coming to kill me, and you want me to go down to the battlefield, stand still, and look at it. Sometimes following God will make you look foolish. But that's why we have to follow God, not based on how things make sense to us, but based on our faith in the fact that God will do what he says. And so when you participate in the process, you got to participate by faith. Which means participating by faith means that your faith will sometimes have to be based on missing information. Because you, when you read the story, God tells them what the enemy is going to do. But he never tells them what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. All right. So your, your, your faith must be sometimes based on what you don't know. Yeah. Can I give you an example here? Yes. Uh, uh, God says, Abraham, I want you to go and sacrifice your only son. Isaac, Abraham on the way up the mountain. Isaac says, Daddy, I see the fire. I see the wood. I see you got the knife. But where is the lamb? For the sacrifice. The Bible says, Abraham says, Son, the Lord will provide. And I tell you what Abraham was really saying, he was saying, Son, I don't know. But I'm trusting in God. Ezekiel testifies to us, Ezekiel, 
down in the valley of dry bones, Ezekiel, can these bones live? These dead dry bones, can they live? Ezekiel says, God, thou knowest. Translation, God, I don't know. But I'm trusting in you. You see, sometimes, church, your faith is going to have to be based on what you don't know. But that's why you have to follow God by faith. Because sometimes when faith has you out there looking foolish, what looks foolish to other people looks faithful to God. And so if I got to look foolish to you, but I'm looking faithful to God, I'm going to stand on what I know that God is going to do for me. And the Bible says that if you've got the faith, God has got the power. Right. But some even better news is that even when you don't have the faith, God still has the power. And so, so you've got to follow him by faith. And when following him by faith makes you look foolish and makes you look weak, you in good company. Because Paul says it's all right to look weak because when I am weak, that's when God I got to rush on here. If I have to participate by faith, mm -hmm. then we got to deal with something in the text. Because when we hear this text preached, most preachers say that uh, praise <coughs> is their weapon. You've heard them say that before. Uh, the Bible, they, they read. Uh, in, you read in the Bible two times in this text, verse 19 and verse 22, they praise God. Mm -hmm. And God then kills the enemy. Now, we, we are taught that praise is their weapon. Oh yeah. But I want to tell you this text is not telling to teach us that praise is their weapon. Mm -hmm. Now before you get mad at me, I want to tell you that I do believe that God inhabits the praises of his people. Oh, yeah. well, I do believe that when praises go up, blessings do come down. I, I believe that. But this text is teaching us something different here. You see, the directions for them were to stand still, to, to seek, to set yourselves, mm -hmm. to stand still, mm -hmm. and see the salvation of the Lord. Am I right about it? Amen. Yeah. The directions were not to, to, set, to seek, to set yourselves, to stand still, to sing and to shout. No, they praised God two times in this text. Verse 19, they praise him. Verse 22, they praise him again. Now, now they praise God the first time uh, on, before they even went down to the battlefield. Uh -huh. Which tells us that praise wasn't their weapon. Their praise was a response to the word they had received from God. Can I explain it to you right here? These are the people of Judah. Judah is the Hebrew name that means praise. So praise was who they were. Praise was a matter of their will. Praise was an act of their faith. That's why David says, I will praise the Lord, I will bless the Lord at all times. That's why he says, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and I will enter into his courts with praise because you praise God if you want to. And you can hold back praise if you don't want to. Uh, but, 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 but for the people of God, your praise is an act of faith. And if God has been good to you, then you ought to praise him. If, if he's opened a whole lot of doors for you, and no matter what stands in front of you, you still ought to praise. There are two times when the children of God ought to be in, ought to be in an act of praise. When you feel like it, and when you don't. Because God has been just that good that if anybody should praise him, you ought to be the first one to say, I will. As a matter of fact, every time I turn around, he's always opening doors, always making ways for me. I will bless his holy name. Now, can I show you the real weapon? And then I'm, then I'm finished here. The real weapon in this text is obedience. You see, when they were obedient to the word of God, that's when God gave them the victory. 
You see, my brothers and sisters, if you are in search for a blessing from God, if you're fighting a battle that you know you cannot win, and God has given you a promise that he will bring you out, you have got to be obedient to what he asks of you to do. You see, now the promise, the promise is he'll give back to you. But first, you have got to give first. Now, the promise is he'll make your enemies your footstool. But first, you've got to be obedient and love them that despitefully use you and pray for your enemies. The promise is he will direct your path. But first, you've got to trust in him with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. If you do what God asks of you to do, he will step in and fight your battle. I'm finished here the blue, in this blueprint for battle. First thing you must do is seek God in prayer. Yes. Second thing you've got to do is participate in the process. Uh -huh. Then when you participate, your participation must be by faith. Finally, unless I hold you too long, when you've done your part, wow. when you've been obedient to what God asks of you to do, yes. uh -huh. the last thing you have to do is process to the victory. Bible says that they were obedient to what God asked them to do. They followed God's directions. They got up early the next morning. Started a procession down to the battlefield. And while they were on their way, somebody started singing. Somebody said he's a battle axe in the time of a battle. And while they were praising God, verse 22 says that the Lord set up ambushments. The enemy turned on each other, killed themselves. Now they hadn't got down to the battlefield yet, but they were praising God in advance. And while they were praising God, God was working on their behalf. Let me ask you a question as I rush to close. What might God be doing for you? Mm. If you would praise him now. Mm. Before your victory on tomorrow. Yeah. Some of y'all just missed that. What, what might God be doing for you? Yeah. If you can thank him today. For what he has ahead of you on tomorrow. Yeah. I'm going to give you one more chance. What might God be doing for you? Yeah. If you can praise him for the victory. Before you get the victory. Yes. Bible says when they got down to the battlefield, mm -hmm. the enemy was already defeated. The victory was already won. Uh -huh. That tells us, my brothers and sisters, that if you let the Lord fight your battles, well. you were never on your way to the battlefield, uh -huh. but you were on your way to the victory. Yes. I'm going to say that one more time. You were never on your way to the battlefield. Yeah. You're just on your way to get your victory. Yeah. This is my exit right here at church. My brother got his first job out of college. He was down in Dallas, Texas. Electrical engineer making a whole lot of money, so he flew me out there one spring break. Took me to the mall. We went into the store called Nordstrom's. He said, I'm going to buy you some expensive shoes. So we in Nordstrom's looking at expensive shoes and, and the salesman is showing us some shoes that were on sale. Well, I picked up a shoe that was not on sale. <laughs> and I asked the salesman, I said, well, these shoes, are these shoes on sale? He said, no, son, these shoes don't go on sale because these are Gucci shoes. <laughs> and if you know anything about Gucci, the salesman said, Gucci has a name. That's a real valuable name. And because the name is so valuable, people will pay the price simply because of the name. Oh, yeah. And so church, I came to tell you that in this blueprint for battle, that God will fight your battles yeah. because his name is on your life. Oh, yeah. The Bible says, that God esteems his name above his word. The Bible says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous runneth therein and are saved. 
The Bible says he has been given a name that's above every name. And at that name, every knee shall bow. And every tongue has got to confess. You've got the name of the Lord on your life. And God will fight your battles because you carry his name. Can I tell you about his name? And I'm in my seat. His name is awesome. And his name is amazing. His name brings blessings. If you can just believe. His name says he cares. And his name is compassionate. His name defeats the devil. And his name gives deliverance. His name is effective. And his name is efficient. His name is faithful. And it casts out all fear. His name is good. And his name is gracious. His name gives hope. In a hopeless situation. His name is incredible. His name is just. And it's just what you need. His name will kill the enemy. And keep the devil off your back. His name is a light. In dark times. His name is merciful. And his name brings miracles. His name will never. Never lose his power. His name opens doors. And overwhelms the enemy. Anybody know his name? Today? His name is perfect. And his name is do all praise. His name can't, it can't be questioned. His name is righteous and his deeds are remarkable. His name will sustain you in the time of storm. His name is a strong tower and his name is triumphant. His name is undefeated because he's never lost a battle. His name is victorious over the works of the devil. His name is excellent in all of the earth. His name is yours to call on when you need him. His name is the zenith. It's above all other names. Is there anybody here that knows his name? There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing his word. Sounds like music in my ear. It's the sweetest name on earth. Anybody know his name? I love Jesus. Anybody love my Jesus? Anybody love the Lord? Can we call his name? Do you know his name? What's his name? What's his name? My soul just got happier. 